So let's talk about the various methods behind job analysis. And there's four key methodologies that are commonly used in the process of job analyses. However, that doesn't mean these are the only methods. So there's interviews, and I would also include under interviews focus groups. And really the difference between an interview, an interview is when it's a one-on-one -on -one interview with an actual interviewer. There's an interviewer, there's an interviewee, and the interviewer, because it's a one-on-one -on -one inter, uh, inter interaction, can basically make various promises of confidentiality in what's being reported. Things can be set off the record. And a lot of times it takes more time, it takes more effort, but you get really good, uh, good data at this point. A focus group is an attempt to basically do interviews with multiple people at one time. So there's still an interviewer, the person running the focus group, but instead of interviewing one person, you're interviewing a group of people. Now, the advantage to a focus group is that you can now do, in the same time you would do an interview with one person, an interview with a group of people. Generally speaking, five to eight seems to be about the good number for a focus group. Now, we're not gonna get detailed into focus groups. I just wanna make you aware of the difference between an interview and a focus group, and why a lot of times focus groups are not necessarily used in job analyses. So there are advantages to it, but you really do need to be trained as a facilitator to successfully run a focus group because the advantages in multiple people being interviewed at the same time are offset by some disadvantages. One of those disadvantages is, is now people are less likely to share their actual thoughts and opinions and are more likely to go along with the group because they have to actually speak in front of their peers. You can no longer promise confidentiality because you can promise confidentiality, but if someone says something a little controversial or something off the record, everyone in the room just heard it, all of them can choose to repeat it. Now you may actually get some synergy. In other words, you may get some ideas or thoughts about the job that you wouldn't have got in individual interviews because one person brings something up and everyone else goes, oh, I, don't, I can't believe I didn't think of that. That's really important too. But sometimes they're just going along to make that person happy. So just recognize that when we're talking interviews, it's not just interviews, but there is a reason that the interview itself, one-on-one, -on -one, in isolation, and confidential, is usually the tool we're gonna to use. Job analyses questionnaires, and these can be everything from off the shelf to off the shelf modified to creation or questionnaires that you've created yourself. I know a fair amount of job analysis people that do these that usually basically kind of go to ONET initially. And one of the first things they'll have people do is simply agree or disagree with each item off the ONET description, especially if the job they're analyzing is very similar to an ONET description. That would count as a type of questionnaire. It's quickly and easily distributed. Everyone that has the job can basically complete it and you're getting a lot of quantitative information. You can also do observations of the job. You yourself can watch people doing the job either through existing artifacts, such as their actual work product. So for example, if you were doing an observation of my performance, you might look at my student reviews. That would be observing, not directly observing, but observing through actual archival information. You might take a look at my academic publications. Those are still observations. You're basically, you're not talking to someone, you're not interviewing them, you're not giving them a questionnaire, but you're gathering data about the job. And finally, critical incidents. This is a kind of a technique to break people out of the box of both the questionnaire and the interview. And it asks people to basically create critical incidents of success or failure on the job. So you're not asking about the KSAs, you're not asking about the specific tasks or responsibilities, you're asking both incumbents and generally managers, tell me about a time someone did something really great on the job. What did they do and what was the impact? Tell me about something, tell me about a time when someone really failed at this job. What did it look like? What was the outcome? That's a critical incident technique and that can be useful as well. Ideally, you wanna use as many methods as you can to get as much types of data as possible, recognizing again that this is a fairly subjective process that we're trying to make objective by gathering as many viewpoints as possible. So again, the job analysis interview, it is the most common. The advantages and disadvantages here, um, and this is where in class we'd probably break into a discussion on each of these slides, but such is the nature of asynchronous online education. Um, the advantages, you get a lot of high level quality qualitative data about the job. You're no longer constraining the person 
to a questionnaire or a survey. So you can go in almost any direction and you can ask a lot of follow-up questions. You can really get rich amounts of detail. The disadvantages are it does take a fair amount of skill and knowledge to be able to interpret all of that qualitative data into meaningful meaning units. And also each individual interview is going to be a unique interview. So how do you find themes across those interviews? How do you make sure that one interview with a very dynamic extroverted person that has extremely strong attitudes about what their job entails does not eclipse shall we say more introverted, less advocating people who still were describing a job but maybe describe it differently. So it's your job as the analyst, the job anal analyst, to be able to work through this process and recognize this difficulty. Generally speaking, when you're doing interviews, if you're interviewing the same group of people, in other words, the same type of SMEs, incumbents, for instance, we generally find that about seven to nine interviews, you'll start to find what we call convergence, which means you're really not getting new information. Now, that is, again, a call that you might want to make. I'm not telling you not to do more than eight or nine interviews, but if you have an organization that's a little reluctant to provide an enormous number of interviews, that's a good number to shoot for. Shoot for seven to nine interviews with each group that you're planning to do interviews with. Job anal analyst questionnaires, task inventories, customized standard job analysis questionnaires, PAQs, rate frequency, importance of time spent. There's a website here that I think is still active, but if not, you can just web search, honestly, job analyst analysis questionnaires and find a fair amount. The advantages here is you can gather an enormous amount of qualitative data fairly quickly, especially in the modern day age of, you can just literally put the questionnaire up online, send out the links and have everyone complete them and get a lot of data that you can analyze. Make sure though that you're one, customizing. So whatever questionnaire you have, go through it, take a look at ONET, understand the job yourself and ask yourself, are there any questions that are completely irrelevant to this job? If so, remove them. Are there any parts of this job that you think that you've already identified through your initial um, examination of the job that are not captured by the questionnaire? Add them. Also make sure that you're getting data that is useful to you, that you're having an, um, your incumbents rate the frequency of the tasks, rate the importance of the task, maybe rate the time spent per day on each task. You're not just wanting to find out, do they do this? You want to find out which of these components are the most important parts of their job from their view. The advantages here, a lot of data, a lot of quantitative data, and a lot of information that can be gathered fairly cheaply and fairly effectively. Disadvantages, you're not getting that rich detail. You're not getting personal opinions. And if there's something that they want to say that isn't on the questionnaire, you're usually not going to capture that as well. A lot of times when planning methodology, you may need to decide the order you're going to use various methodologies. So you always want to start with a broad idea of the job, any existing job analysis that is there, any job descriptions. If you can find an ONET listing, if you can do a little bit of observation or talking to the manager that's actually kind of responsible for the job you're analyzing, those are always good. But you may also want to break up the interview process. You may want to do a few interviews to kind of get a better idea about the job, use all that information to create tailored job analysis questionnaires. And then if the, after the questionnaires are done, if you still have some questions, maybe do additional interviews. So again, you wanna kind of think about how are you stacking these methodologies to make sure that you're maximizing their usefulness. Task inventories are another way to go, and they're similar to questionnaires. Um, just as a general note, whenever we're sending out questionnaires, whenever we're doing interviews, all of this is fairly important. We want to make sure that we're doing cover letters. We want to make sure we're explaining what we're doing. We want to be transparent, and we want to make sure people understand why they're going through this process. Basically, a task inventory is a little less than a questionnaire because it is focused simply on the task selection and directions KSO selection and directions and demographic information. So a task inventory is basically just asking people, and this again might be something you send out before a questionnaire. What are your tasks? And give them directions on how to define those tasks. And what KSAOs do you need to do those tasks? And again, how do you select them and how do you write them out? And generally we might collect demographic information as well. So again, this is kind of a, a, an older technique 
Um, kind of predates a lot of the pre-existing questionnaires, but still not a bad idea of another way to think about collecting data. So again, I talked about observations. Generally speaking, observations should be probably early or late in the process. So early means that you're observing it just to get a better understanding of the job, to be able to create interview guides, focus group guides, or to tailor questionnaires, or late to answer questions that may have come up through the data you gathered through the other methods. Now the advantage of this is you're no longer having to rely on people's opinions. You're no longer having to rely on their responses. You're getting to watch the job. So now the disadvantages are, do you actually have the knowledge, skills, and ability and understanding of the job to interpret what you see? In other words, you, the data collection is now on your skill set, not theirs. And again, people are gonna know you're observing them 99% of the time, unless you're actually working in an organization that the employees are already being videoed regularly as a part of their job, then you could possibly just watch the tapes, but that's fairly rare in most organizations. So the disadvantage is, is even though you're now getting to observe the job, you're probably gonna observe the job at its higher level. Um, most people basically put on their best face when they're being observed. Um, and it's probably a good idea. Um, just a quick little story here. I was actually up for a fairly major teaching award. And a part of that award process was that five of my classes were going to be audited, which means that someone was going to come in and watch me teach the entire time. The semester that this was happening, I was actually teaching relatively boring, mainly focused on statistics classes. I was basically teaching research methods and statistics classes. And the days that I was told that I was going to be observed were days that were quite honestly fairly dry informational lectures on how to do mathematics. Um, I considered changing my syllabus. I considered moving a cooler, more interesting, more discussion focused lecture onto those observation days. I actually didn't do it. By the way, I didn't get the award either. Um, I went ahead and just stuck with the lectures that they were intended because I honestly thought the integrity of my class was more important about than what someone thought of my teaching as they watched me for an award. Um, but that is the disadvantage is most people are going to make that move. Most people are going to make sure that you kind of see them at their best and see the job at their best. And you need to recognize that as well. And those disadvantages that we've talked about with each of these methods is one of the reasons that you want to use multiple methods. All of them have advantages, but all of them have disadvantages. And the way you get around those disadvantages is you use multiple methods. Another technique we can use is the critical incident technique. An example of that, again, is we want examples of really good or bad performance. So we're kind of breaking people out of the kind of breaking the job apart in tasks and skills and qualifications and knowledge and now having them just focus on what is a good example of doing your job well what is a bad example of doing your job poorly for instance so you want to use performance appraisal used for performance appraisal training needs assessment and structure interview development so again a lot of times we may start with a critical incident technique we may simply just do some very quick interviews with both incumbents and managers asking them to provide us examples of good and bad performance. And then we can use that as an initial qualitative data source to help guide our creation of a structured interview guide for later and again, tailoring those questionnaires. Now we do need to make sure that we're getting useful information and the characteristics of a critical incident is that it should be specifically focused on observable behaviors. In other words, it shouldn't be just like, they're just always in a bad mood and that's what makes the job horrible. Well, that's not very useful. It needs to be observable behaviors. It needs to be described in context and there needs to be a consequence or outcome. So it needs to be sufficiently detailed with no mention of traits or judgments. So if you're making a judgment about the person, if you're talking about how they're just lazy or they're just this way, that's not a good critical incident. So a bad critical incident would be, they're always grumpy and I just don't know how to work with them. A good critical incident would be, I specifically asked if they could make copies. They responded interpersonally poorly, but said that they could. They really didn't have anything else going on at the time. And it turns out they didn't actually get it done on time and I had to ask someone else to do it, delaying my report. Those are behaviors, that's context, and it shows the consequence. 
So again, it can be hard to completely remove judgments or traits, but that's what we're trying to do. And sometimes to do critical incident techniques, we do need to do a little bit of training of the incumbents of what we're expecting from these critical incidents. Because if they're phrased in the ways of behavior, contents, and con consequences, we can use that data much easily, much more easily, to be able to kind of tailor the rest of the job analysis. So again, I observed an employee looking through a scrap tub. She came to me stating that someone had thrown away a large piece of cast iron piston. We salvaged the piston and later used this piece to make a pulley for a very urgently needed job. So that's a good example. It's got context, it tells us the behaviors, and it tells us the outcome. The employee completely lacked initiative in getting the job done. While there was plenty of opportunity, I couldn't count on her deliver. That's making judgments, that's talking about personality, and it really doesn't talk about specific behaviors or specific outcomes. So you can kind of see the difference of what we're working for when we talk about a critical incident technique. So we don't want that one, we want the top one. So let's talk briefly now. We've kind of talked about methodology and notice that I've spent one slide, a little bit of advantages and disadvantages on every one of these methodologies, but recognize that each one has its entire own skill set. There's an entire skill set to doing interviews and creating a structured interview guide. There's an entire skill set to doing focus groups correctly. There's an entire skill set to the psychometrics and how you actually make surveys. It's one of the reasons we often want to start with an out of the box pre-existing survey that's well respected in the field. We can kind of hope that that means that they've done their research on making sure it's psychometrically sound, it's measuring what it's supposed to measure. But again, we need to tailor it for the job. If someone hits a whole bunch of questions that they really don't have answers to because they're not relevant to their job, we're also going to lose their interest. So just recognize that this was a very broad overview of the techniques. And the main message here was we want to use as many techniques as is feasible to do a good job. Now I want to talk a little bit about the legal issues for job analysis, and this comes from the Uniform Guideline for Employee Selection Procedures. And remember, the Uniform Guidelines are not a law, but they are given high deference in the court. So these are basically um, uh, what we found about how job analyses are actually accessed, used, and discussed in court cases. First thing is, is that the courts have determined that they have to be fairly specific for a job. In other words, again, we kind of talked about initially that when we do a job analysis, we have to find that kind of middle ground between not getting so specific that every single person's job has its own description, but also making sure it's not too generic to where there is jobs that clearly are not being captured by the job analysis. So again, when a job analysis has been brought forth in a court, when it's been found to be too generic, for example, faculty across an entire university, usually it has not been found to be very useful in defending whatever decisions were made on that job analysis. However, when the job analysis is specific enough that it clearly kind of captures the job that's under discussion legally, it usually has been given deference. It has to be in writing. It shouldn't just should be, it really needs to be a report and it should detail the job analysis procedures used. So again, what this gets at is that it needs to be a written report, it needs to be a report that's generally available, and the next two points, detailed job analysis procedures and a large sample, both and a representative sample, that gets to the methodology, and I wanna talk about that briefly. That means that every good job analysis should have a method section. It should entail what you did, the process you used, the order of interviews, questionnaires, focus groups, observations, maybe even the actual appendices of the actual notes that you took. And it should also have information of how you gathered the sample for each of these methods and how large it was. However, all of that is relatively irrelevant to the actual use of the job analysis. This stuff should all be at the end of the job analysis or potentially even all of it in appendices. The job analysis itself must include tasks and duties and activities. So it basically has to detail what is actually involved in the job and it has to include the KSAs. The competency level for an entry level job must be specified. In other words, what is the minimum knowledge, skills and ability for someone to get this job? And it needs to identify essential job functions. And that's for the Americans for Disability Act. So a good job analysis needs to do all of these things. 
A good job analysis should include methodology and information about the sampling process and the representativeness of that sample, though they should be at the very end of the report because HR doesn't really need that. You need that in case it's ever challenged. The job itself must include that kind of work-oriented task duties and activities, that worker-orientated um, KSAs. It has to have information of what is the minimum you need to get the job, and that those minimums need to be defended by the task list and the KSAs. And finally, in the task list, you do need to identify key tasks that have to be completed in order for the job to function. In other words, every job has the potential under the American with Disability Act to have certain components of it reworked dependent on a disability. However, ADA makes it very clear that if the actual um, uh, requirements to change the job for a disability basically make the job redundant or not needed anymore, in other words, the key tasks are no longer being done of the reason this job exists, in that case, it is legal for you to hire someone that maybe doesn't have that disability that would stop those essential job functions, which means a job analysis needs to list what are the job functions that simply have to be done for this job to exist. We're talking a little bit about writing job descriptions themselves. Again, when we're writing the job description part, we want to list each one of the tasks and we want to list one, each one of the KSAs. And the way we're going to list that is kind of a specific type of language that we're going to go over now. So again, job description should be better than this. Your job description, stay in your cubicle and try not to make things worse. We want to really be able to be to kind of succinctly describe what the job entails, what you do in the job, and what knowledge, skills, and abilities you need to do that well. So the task statement. Task statement should be focused on what do you do, what do you do it to, why do you do it, and how do you do it. So for an example, piles and covers furniture. So what do they do? They pile and cover. What do they do it to? Furniture clothing and other valuables to protect material from fire and water damage using salvage covers. That is a task statement. So you need to be able, in this job, this is someone that actually goes in to basically, I guess, kind of close down a business until someone else is ready to use it. And one of the things they need to be able to do is to understand how to use salvage covers to cover and protect materials from damage. So that is a good example. It says what, it says to who or to what, it says why, why you're doing it, and what tools you need to use. Now, ideally, the shorter the task statement, the better, but you really want to get down to kind of this level, and you do want to ask, is it answering these questions? So when you're writing task statements, you, these are phrases, these are bullet points, they're not sentence. So we never have to put the worker or the person because it's implied. It needs to be clear, it needs to be specific, it needs to indicate the scope, and it needs to be brief and use action verbs. And generally speaking, if it can be broken up into multiple components, in other words, if you find yourself kind of writing a paragraph, the chances are you're not writing a single task. You're writing a series of tasks. Break them up. Each task should have a clear single action verb that then we can ask the questions of who, to what, why, what are the outcomes, what tools. Action verbs can include manage, supervise, directs, develops, maintains, types, scans, reads, reviews, writes. Just again, there needs to be an action verb. If there is not an action verb, you're not describing a behavior that can be observed. Once you have the task statements, we now need to indicate the importance. List from the most important to the least important, and also the percentage of total working time. This can be a range, but should add up to approximately 100%. Now notice these are separate. Importance may not be the same as time. So the very most important thing you do on your job may only be 1% of your time. It would still be at the top of the list. But we're going to basically give information on both. A good list of task statements will be rank ordered from the most important task to the least important task. And then we'll also include approximately amount of time the person spends on each one of these tasks in an average work day or work week, depending on the complexity of the job. For KSAs, we're basically wanting to find specific single knowledge, skills, or abilities that can be defined. So for example, basic typing skill, oral fact-finding ability, written communication skills. So oral expression, the ability to communicate information or ideas speaking so others will understand. You want to be specific about the level. 
differentiate KSAs learned on the job from those expected at the time of hire. So for example, if you do find that there are KSAs you have to have to get the job, they may be listed separately than KSAs you will, it would be nice for you to have or you could learn on the job. You wanna make that differentiation. Also, generally speaking, a KSA is going to have a title like basic typing, oral fact finding, written communication, oral expression, and then a brief one sentence description specifying the level. So again, this is kind of the process we're gonna to use to write the KSAs.